A very good evening to all the respected dignitaries, guests, colleagues, and dear delegates. Thank you all for joining this webinar. I, Dr. Preeti Bharadwaj, head of the Department of Orthodontics at Mansarovar Dental College, extends a warm and hearty welcome to Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Jyotendra Kumar Sir, Honorable Guest of Honor Dr. U. S. Krishna Naik Sir, respected Dean <laughs> Mansarovar Dental College. Dr. Gurudat Naik sir, eminent speaker, Dr. Ramesh Sablok sir, President ICD Section 6, Dr. R.T. Gupta sir, Professor Dr. Mahesh Verma sir, Secretary General ICD Section 6, Dr. Rajiv Chuk sir, Organizing Chairperson, respected Dr. D.N. Kapoor sir, Deputy Region Central Zone ICD Section 6, Dr. V.S. Kauli sir, Fellows of ICD, colleagues and dear delegates. I welcome you all to this webinar on the clinical management of class two treatment by removal and fixed functional appliance by Dr. Ramesh Sablo. This webinar is jointly organized by Mansarova Dental College, Bhopal, and Central Zone of ICD, Section 6, India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal section. This webinar was possible due to the great vision and guidance of respected Mrs. Tiwari, ma'am, Chancellor. Mansarovar Global University and respected engineer, Gaurav Tiwari sir, CED, Pro Chancellor, Mansarovar Global University, Bhopal. Without their support and guidance, this program would not have been possible. Dr. D.N. Kapoor sir, Master Fellow of ICD Section 6, has been instrumental in organizing this program. Respected Dean of Mansarovar Dental College, Dr. Gurudat Naik sir has played a very vital role and has been instrumental in organizing this webinar. May I now take the opportunity to introduce our chairperson and mentor and guide, Dr. D.N. Kapoor sir, who has more than 50 years of teaching experience, former dean of KGMC Lucknow, Kotiwal Dental College, former DCI member. I would request him to kindly introduce our chief guest of the day. Jian Kapoor, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. Am I audible? Yes. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. It is my privilege to welcome Professor Jatendra Kumar, Professor Krishna Naik, and Dr. Ramesh Sablok, and our President, International College of Dentists, Dr. R.B. Gupta, on the dais. And it's a pleasure to introduce. Dr. Jyotendra Kumar as chief guest for this webinar, which is arranged for celebrating the centenary year of International College of Dentists, Head's Office, which is located in Michigan, USA. Dr. Jyotendra Kumar is very well known in the field of orthodontics in particular and in dentistry in general. Dr. Jatendra Kumar earned his BDS and MDS in 1981 from Kerala University, and he is also a mem MRT, member of the orthodontics from the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh and Glasgow. Later on, he, did his he earned his fellowship from the Royal College of Dental Surgeons, Glasgow and Edinburgh. As he started his career as a tutor in 1981, and in 40 years, he excelled himself and rose to the chair and occupied with chair as retired joint director of medical education, government of Kerala. Dr. Jatendra Kumar served as a professor of orthodontics in Government Dental College, Trivandrum, for over 10 years. And then later on, he was elevated as, as principal and dean of the Faculty of Dentistry, Kerala University. He is a fellow of the International College of Dentists. He is FAI. He is fellow of the uh, Perry Fishward Academy. He is fellow of the International Dental Research. And he is past president of Indian Orthodontic Society and past chairman of Indian Board of Orthodontics, and also 
past president of the Indian Society of Dental Research. He is recipient of the many accolades and an award, the best doctor award from the government of Kerala, best research award of IADR India section, and he earned his gold medal for contribution to the biomaterial research. He has been recipient of Dr. H. S. Sheikh Memorial Oration and had been recipient of the KK Mystery Scroll of Honor for Indian from Indian Orthodontic Society. He has been in Indian Orthodontic Society as vice president. He had been president of the Indian Orthodontic Society and he had been uh, editor of the Indian Orthodontic Society. Besides this, he had been in the, he has played a very instrumental role in Dental Council of India as executive member. And he has, he has uh, been guide and examiner for, for many international and national board, uh, universities and uh, he guided his PhD uh, students and examiner for PG and undergraduates. Besides this, he has been very actively involved in research. He has presented 125 research papers in, uh, in various conferences, published 25 distinguished articles, which has been uh, published in the international journal. He's, is also regional dental advisor for Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and Scotland. Besides this, I mean, he has played very, very instrumental role in academics, research, and dental council. With these few words, I welcome and hand over mic to him. Dr. Jatanta Kumar, please. Thank you, DN Kapoor, sir. Thank you for the kind words you spoke about me. Good evening to all of you. It's indeed a great pleasure to see so many luminaries and stalwarts. Uh, as per protocol, let me acknowledge Professor R.P. Gupta, President of the ICD section, my dear friend U.S. Krishna Naik, uh, Principal of the Manasarova College, Dr. Gurudat Naik, Professor of Orthodontics at Manasarova, Dr. Preeti, uh, and my dear friend, Dr. Ramesh Sablog, who is here to deliver the lecture. I'm very glad to be present here, and I profusely thank our senior teacher, Pursar, who has been a Vishwa Guru to all of us. Thank you, sir, for the invitation, but for which I would not have been here today. Thank you for calling me and remembering me. I'm very glad that Corona has thrown up this opportunity to bring together people using this virtual media technology. It actually points to the fact that in ICD, we used to have just annual meetings, that we should have more meetings perhaps using this medium. And I'm very sure it will help and go a long way in keeping us up to date in these times when we are physically apart. Well, I don't want to say much because we have an excellent lecture ahead of us. I only thank Professor Kapoor again for inviting me. I wish Dr. Sablok's lecture, Godspeed. I am sure he will do a great job. And to all the listeners here whom I'm not seeing, I wish you good listening and learning experience from this lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation to be the chief guest. Thank now, you. I will pleasure. take the opportunity to invite Dr. V.S. Kohli, sir, to kindly introduce our guest of honor, Dr. U.S. Krishnaik, sir. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure, a pleasure, and a pleasure from the bottom of my heart to welcome Professor U.S. Krishnayak. I don't know, think all of us, the dental faculty know Dr. Krishnayak so well that to introduce him would be actually a, a small word. He would require a literature full of things to tell about him. He's a dynamic person, but let me suffice it by saying a few little words. Uh, Professor Krishnayak will have to excuse me for not going into the details of all your achievements. Please bear with me because of the time paucity. Professor U.S. Krishnanayak secured his 
BGS degree from the College of Dental Surgery, KMC Manipal, and later went on to do his MDS in orthodontics from the same college in 1985. Mm -hmm. He is the principal and dean, head of the largest orthodontic department mm -hmm. in the country that has churned out a record number of 250 postgraduates over the past 30 years. Dr. U.S. Krishnanayak has been the president of the Indian Dental Association head office 2000-2001. He's been the national president of the Indian Orthodontic mm -hmm. Society. And I love him for having been had such a lovely tenure, 1999 to 2000. He's the chairman of the Pierre Foucault Academy, 2011-2012, India section. He's been the president of the International College of Dentists, section six. And I distinctly remember he giving me an award and I'm so grateful to you for that, sir. To top it all, it has been conferred, he has been conferred the very prestigious Outstanding Professor Award in 2014 at the national level of the Indian Orthodontic Society and has also been bestowed upon with the Mastership of International College of Dentists, USA. He has published a number of scientific papers in the journals of repute across the country, world. With these very few words, I request Dr. Krishnan Ayak to come on the screen and greet and say thanks. And we thank you for coming, joining us, sir. Dr. Krishnan Ayak. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Kohli, uh, for those very kind words of introduction. Uh, President of the ICT India section in this centenary year, Professor Dr. Gupta, uh, Professor Dr. D. N. Kapoor, the chairman of this program, Professor Dr. Jyotindir Kumar, my very, very dear friend and the chief guest for this program, Professor Preeti Gurudath, who, who hails from uh, uh, Bangalore. I'm uh, just, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, pardon my personal indulgence. Hi, Gurudath. Uh, it's a long time we have met, though. Yes, sir. And uh, all the other, Professor Dr. Chug, the Secretary General of ICD Section 6, and all the other participants who have logged on to this very interesting lecture by Professor Sablok. Professor Sablok, welcome, sir. I should thank you, first of all, for uh, sparing your valuable time to enlighten our uh, audience or the participants for this webinar on class two correction with the uh, removal and fixed functional appliances. It has been a, it's a pleasure to see you after a very long time, though we Thank have you, interact sir. on uh, social media. Uh, so, we met last time in and, uh, Absolutely, absolutely, not too far, but not too far ago. Yes. Huh? But having said that, as Dr. Jatinder Kumar said, this is one more platform. We are probably forced to, you know, uh, adapt, but having, it has got its own positive uh, positives, and let us look at the positive aspect. So we are here uh, having this webinar today and uh, seeing and interacting with each other. And I'm sure all the participants, which are very large in number, would uh, go back richly knowledge on the concept of class two correction after listening to your lecture for the next hour, hour and a half. Uh, I would failing in my duty if I do not congratulate Professor Dr. Uh, Dian Kapoor and the entire team behind this team of Mansarovar Dental College, Professor Dr. Preeti, Professor Gurudath, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, recollect the names of the Chancellor and the Pro-Chancellor who uh, Preeti mentioned. I also congratulate them and thank them for supporting the activity of the ICD in its centenary year. And I wish this function or uh, this webinar all the very best and a very fruitful next one and a half hours for each participant who has logged in. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Sablok, and thank you, Dr. Dean Kapoor, for giving me this opportunity to share or participate in this program with the luminaries like Dr. Sablok, Dr. Jutnir Kumar, Dr. V.S. Kohli, and uh, Dr. Dean Kapoor himself, Dr. Preeti, not to forget all my other senior colleagues like Professor Chuk, et cetera. Thank you very much and all the very best God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your words of wisdom. Thank you so much. 
Uh, may I now take the opportunity to introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. Ramesh Sablok, sir, who completed his undergraduation and post-graduation from prestigious KGMC Lucknow, his master's in orthodontic from Louisiana State University, USA, and has fellowship from Royal College of Surgeons and Physicians, Edinburgh, diplomat of Royal College of Surgeons, and he has certified specialization in lingual orthodontics, Invisalign, growth modification with the functional appliances. He is recipient of numerous honors and awards. He has a professional experience of above 40 years in both clinical and academic aspects. He is currently a consultant orthodontist in USA. He has a number of publications to his credit and has conducted more than 150 workshops and courses on various aspects in orthodontics. Recently published chapter in the book on functional appliance by Dr. William Clark. So may I now request Dr. Ramesh Sablok sir to kindly share his knowledge through his presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Today I am going to speak to you about the clinical management of the removable and fixed functional appliances. With the time framework, we will see that how much we covered today. So let us start firstly with the removable appliances. And uh, basically, I'm going to talk about basically, firstly, about the growth modification, then the factors for improving the effectiveness of the class two treatment, <clears throat> especially the timing of the treatment, the stage of the skeletal maturity, individual patient responsiveness, clinical management of the twin block appliance, and fixed twin blocks. And then we come over to the clinical management of the forces appliance. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you don't hear me, just stop me. Just tell me. Yes, sir. Sure. So, today I'm going to talk to you about the dentofacial orthopedics in five dimensions. We as clinicians, we always... But the more important thing, especially in a growing patient, the most important thing is the fourth dimension, which is somehow is more important than the earlier three I mentioned which should we also take into considerations where the child may be growing or what level, what level of the skeletal maturity is there. So time is another uh, dimension which we should take into consideration. Now the question is asked, does timing of the orthodontic treatment influence the outcome significantly? Or we should ask that at what stage of skeletal maturity we should treat this particular patient and the second question we ask is, is the treatment timing different in different malocclusions? So if we see this patient who came to me at 12 years of age, she's at the peak of the pubertal growth spurt. She has got a retrogenetic mandible and of course quite a bit of dental velar protrusion, short facial height. Now these kind of patients are perfect for growth modification. How we treat these patients? And when we treat it at the right time, at 12 years, that is at the peak of the pubertal growth spurts, that is the, you see a beautiful smile a profile of the patient, as well as the profile has improved, the vertical has improved, and this is how we treat patients with the functional appliances. So when we talk about the available treatment strategies for the class two treatment, there are many options available. You have functional appliances, you have molar distillation appliances, you have class two elastics, or you have got extra oral headgears. Today, we are concentrating on the functional appliances. So when we talk about the functional appliances, we are going to talk about how do they work? And at what age should we use them? And then what are the different type of functional appliances, fixed or removable, and which cases should we choose? And then we should also discuss about the, how much do the patients wear them? The, what is the compliance level of the patients? So what is a functional appliance basically? A functional appliance is a removable or fixed appliance that alters the posture of the mandible and transmits the forces created by the resulting stretch of the muscles and soft tissues and by the change of the neuromuscular environment to the dental and skeletal tissues to produce movement of the teeth and the modification of the growth. So what is the concept of the functional therapy? The functional appliances basically posture the mandible downward and forward with the intent 
that the muscles and the soft tissue pressure attempting to reposition the jaw back to the original position would modify the jaw growth to correct the class two skeletal pattern. So this destruction of the mandibular condyles out of the glenoid fossa reduces the pressure on the actually growing condylar cartilage and alters the muscle tension on the condyles, increasing the amount of endochondrial growth. Now, basically all functional appliances induce a change in the postural equity of the craniofacial musculature. So basically they all induce a change in the craniofacial uh, postural equity of the uh, of the craniofacial musculature when we bring the mandible forward. This change or this pressure of change in the postural activity leads to the changes in the uh, skeletal adaptations of the condyle as well as in the glenoid fossa and change in the growth of the TM joint. In this picture, cephalometric tracings, you can see when we keep a functional appliance, the mandible, it posture the mandible forward and the condyle is brought forward downward from the eminence, which moves the, removes the unusual friction functional stresses and the indirectly the retractor group of muscles are activated as exerting some force against the maxillary arch and it restricts the growth of the, of the maxilla. So what are the changes taking place in the, in the condyle and the, and the glenoid fossa? When you see this, there's a divergent growth factors that move the jaw bases forward the articular effectiveness of the artic this activator appliance, which all of us knows, moves the condyle into a forward downward position and adaptation to the new position through the condylar growth. So adaptation to the new position by remodeling of the fossa, as well as the new bone formation takes place on the condylar head, condylar cartilage. When we see a patient at 12 years of age and which has got retrognathic mandible it is right at the peak of the pubertal growth spurt. And you see within two years, we are able to get a nice profile. Clinically, how it looks that we, uh, we, this is a retrognathic mandible with low facial height, facial height. And if you see the changes in three dimensions, it increases the vertical, it moves the lower jaw forward and improves the profile. This is the effect of functional jaw orthopedic provided it is done at the right time at the peak of the pubertal growth spurt. Bill Clark, with whom I have been associated for almost 30, more than 30 years, he has mentioned that the challenge of functional therapy is to maximize the genetic potential of the growth and guide the growing phase and developing dentition forward a pattern of optimal development. Now the question is normally asked, can mandibular growth be altered in a clinical significant way? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. We can hear yes, you. Sir. Okay. Now, the most important question is, can the mandibular growth be altered in a clinical significant way and how? To answer this question, I'm taking this drawing from Profit and Field, where we are showing the expected growth of the mandible without any intervention. And then let's presume there is a, there is a stimulation and because of the stimulation, the size of the mandible increases. And if there is, a, we are putting a temporary stimulation in the end, the, the growth of the mandible and the stimulation uh, um, which we have provided for stimulating the mandibular growth almost ends up in the same. Though, but at the end of the functional therapy, is the final length of the mandible greater than it would have been without the intervention? At the end of the growth, is there any absolute increase in the mandibular length or is it just a temporal stimulation? To answer these questions, we have evidence-based treatment, experimental studies, and the clinical studies. I am just start, uh, giving a very brief review about the growth before we switch over to the, the appliance. Can mandibular growth be influenced in the controlled experimental settings? So there are a number of studies done right from the time of of Norman Kingsley in 1880. And then a lot of studies done on the primate monkeys, uh, right by Brittner, Hoppel in 1880s. And then the main work was done by Jim McNamara in Ann Arbor, Michigan. There was people in Alexander Petro uh, in France and, and also in Strasbourg in Germany, Sturzman who did a lot of studies on the monkeys on the length of the mandible. So what 
this is a classical study done by Jim McNamara. This is his PhD thesis. What he has done is he has taken the monkeys and make own plants. And he has, it's like an inclined plane relationship. These are tyconium own plants in an like in inclined planes. And he has moved the, the lower jaw in a forward position from class one to class three position. And, and the changes take place in the condylar cartilage. There's a proliferation of the condylar before, sorry, I go back. Uh, So this is the, the monkey studies. There's a proliferation of the condylar cartilage in, the, in this group, as well as changes in the condyle. There's a, the proliferation of the osteocytes as well as the post glenoid fossa uh, after the, the for, forces are put or the, the, the appliances put. And after two weeks, you see quite a bit of proliferation of the condylar cartilage as well as the, in, the, in the bones, osteocytes. And after 24 weeks, there's the establishment, the almost a new establishment, new bone is formed, and you will see that the condyle is moving forward, and there is a proliferation of the condyle. So he, he compared it with the control group uh, with the monkeys. After 144 weeks, he found out that there is an increase of seven millimeter of length of the mandible uh, when. Um, the long-term mandibular adaptation to the producive function in the rhesus monkeys. So it means in non-human primate studies, we can increase the length of the mandible to six to seven millimeters. So what he did is, this was published in AGODO in 1987. He monitored the incremental mandibular growth in monkeys using a series of protective appliances. So after 48 weeks, increase in mandibular condyle and base length were noted in the treated animals. And after three years, which is equivalent to nine to 10 years in humans, because the monkeys grow three times faster than the humans, the mandible of treated animals were nearly seven millimeter longer. So these protrusive appliances cause disruption of the normal neuromuscular activities. Animal response by typically posturing the mandible forward, which is a structural adaptation. And it induces changes, including the condylar cartilage, proliferation and subsequent bony adaptation in TM joint resulting in a net increase in the mandibular length. Now the question is where is the condyle after the treatment? So Don Woodside from University of Toronto, he did research on this in adult, adolescent and juvenile primates, the continuous and progressive mandibular protrusion produces extensive anterior remodeling of the glenoid fossa. The glenoid fossa appears to be remodeling entirely with a lot of bone deposition on the interior border of the post glenoid fossa. These are these pictures from the Hunspy Church with the hub appliance. The changes take place in the posterior portion of the post glenoid fossa, as well as the addition of the condylar cartilage. So when we see this picture from Profit, textbooks of Profit, this is how the mandible grows from the cranial base. So the chin moves downward and forward. The mandible growth as viewed from the perspective of vital staining studies, which reveals minimum changes in the body and chin area, while there is exceptional growth and remodeling of the ramus when it moves posteriorly. The correct concept of mandibular growth that the mandible is translated downward and forward and grows upward and backward in response to transition, maintaining its contact with the skull. If you see this infant's skull and how the growth takes place, not only from the condyle only, but the, if you see this, the, the, the condyle in the infant, it, now it becomes the anterior portion in, a, in the adult. And the changes take place, the deposition of bone takes place on the posterior portion of the ramus and more resorption of the anterior portion. So what is the best time to begin class two treatment? So we all, all know that growth is not a linear process. There are spurts when there's accelerated period of growth in terms of height or condyles or sutures. And there's a, uh, when there is another period when this growth slows down. When you see in the juvenile or pre-pubertal stage, there's hardly any growth, but during the peak of the pubertal spurt, which happens around 10 to 12 years in girls and 12 to 14 years in boys, we land up in peak in the pubertal growth spurt. When we can treat 
these patients with functional appliances and get the maximum benefit of this. So we all know about the chronological age, the, the, how the teeth are developing deciduous, but chronological uh, you know, uh, age or chronological way of looking at the teeth is not the right way we can see the, the, uh, the actual growth spurt. So the chronological timings is not the right time to judge the skeletal maturity in the patients. So is there any other way to determine the optimal treatment timings? So the treatment outcome, we say it is like a function of the treatment timings because craniofacial growth is not a linear process as we discussed already. So we need a biological indicators for a skeletal maturity. To judge that, the evaluation of the individual skeletal maturation is the operational basis to determine the optimal timings, the optimal time to start orthodontic treatment for different malocclusions. So I am going to discuss with you the cervical vertebral maturation method for the assessment of optimal timing in dentofacial orthopedics. So we the, the state there are six stages. CS1 and 2 are prepubertal, CS3 and CS4 are pubertal, and CS5 and CS6 are the postpubertal. So between CS3 and CF4, we have got the peak in the mandibular growth. Initially, this was a, uh, the lot of work has been done. There was a thesis by Don Lamparski from the University of Pittsburgh. And later on, Bassetti and Frankie and McNamara, they actually improved upon this and did a lot of work on the CVM. They have published in AGODO as well as in seminars in orthodontics. So what then, uh, the, there was, this was after Don Lamparski in 1972. What he has done is he has taken the cervical vertebra two, three, four, and five, and six, whereas then Bassetti and McNamara just removed the three vertebras and only kept second, third, and fourth. So what are the changes taking place? So basically, there are changes in the shape. We have got trapezoidal shapes, and then we have got notches, and then we have got rectangular horizontal, then we have square, and then we have rectangular vertical. So I'm going to spend five minutes teaching you how to see the, the, the level of the skeletal maturity with CVM. Let's talk about CS1. So when we see the cervical stage one, the all lower borders are flat and C3 and C4 are trapezoidal in shape. And we compare it by a cheddar cheese. When we see the cheese, yeah, and we compare this type, the lower borders equivalent to a cheddar cheese. So basically in CS1, it is the lower surfaces are flat and the shape is trapezoidal in shape. In CS2, there's a notch and still they are in trapezoidal in form and the, there is a concavity in the cervical, uh, cervical vertebra too. And we again compare it with the cheddar cheese. Whereas the in CS3, which is a very important stage, and we say this is the peak interval starts, the peak of the pubertal growth spurt, where the notches starts with the lower border of the second and third vertebra, and the shape is, is trapezoidal or rectangular horizontal in shape. Again, we compare it with the cheddar cheese. Now, this is the most important stage. The peak interval ends at this stage, the pubertal peak, and there are notches in second, third, and fourth vertebra. And this is just after one year after the pubertal growth spurt CS4. And this is the peak interval ended one year before this stage CS5. It's like a marshmallow. Marshmallow is a confectionery in USA. It's like a, uh, you get in the market. And this is the shape is more of a squarish in nature and little bit bite has been cut from the down. So he compared it McNamara to the marshmallow stage. So their concavities on C2, C3, C4, and the shape is more squarish in shape, CS5. Whereas in CS6, the growth is over, completed now, and all borders show the concavities, and at least one of the bodies, C3, they are rectangular vertical in shape. And he has compared it with the marshmallow stage. So it is very easy evaluated on the same cephalogram, which we use for orthodontic diagnosis, it takes only 20 seconds to see the level of the growth 
and it is reproducible in 90% of the patients. Now, one of the greatest effects of the functional orthopedic appliances occur when the peak in the mandibular growth is included in the treatment period. When we see the pre pubertal stage, it is very good for rapid mental expansion or for when we use in class three cases, the face mask, but the pubertal growth spurt or the peak of the pubertal growth spurt is best utilized during the growth modification with the functional appliances. And then we should also know when the growth is over for placing the implants or when we go for the orthognathic surgery. So the greater effects of functional orthopedic appliances occur when the peak in the mandibular growth is included in the treatment period. So this one year of period during which the greatest increase in the total mandibular length we are including from condylone to nathione occurs in the individual patients. And this peak it happens, the maximum increase is around 5.5 millimeter. The gr growth takes place in this, in this patient. So if this was a study which was done by McNamara and Gu is from Peking. So between C3 and C4, the maximum growth changes take place. So this is from C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, and C6. So this is the period we should take into consideration when we are treating patients with the functional appliances. Now the question comes, functional jaw orthopedics class two appliances, are they effective in improving significantly the mandibular length and the sagittal position? To answer these questions, there are two factors. Factors for improving the effectiveness of class two treatment. The first one is the timing of the treatment, the stage of the skeletal maturity, and the second one is individual patient responsiveness. So let's talk about the timing of treatment, the stage of the skeletal maturity. This is a master article by uh, Tiziano, Bassetti, Lorenzo, Frankie, and McNamara. Those who are orthodontists, they know they are the legends in orthodontics who have done published, I think, thousands of articles and books. And this was done with the chairman from Italy, Paolo Cosa. She's a dear friend. Tiziano Bassetti is no more with us. He died in, um, uh, in, uh, while he was giving a symposium in Czechoslovakia. During the treatment of the class two malocclusion with functional appliances, does the mandible grow more than in the masked untreated control? What is the role of the treatment timing? So there was an updated version of this article in AGODO in 2011. So there were around 723 articles out of which he selected 28 studies. And out of 28 studies, only eight studies were having giving information about the skeletal maturity of the treated or untreated subjects by means of a biological indicator, either a hand at risk analysis or CVM method. If you see these studies, these were the landmark studies by Tulloch from North Carolina for early treatment by, by Kevin Bryan in, on the twin block in, uh, in England. And then there are a number of people like Keeling from Florida, these were the studies and ultimately, they found out there are eight studies who have taken the, the biological indicators. But the studies were, which were done in pre-peak period, too early, like seven to eight years, the amount of supplementary growth was only less than two millimeter, almost negligible. So we take an effective supplementary increase, at least minimum three millimeter, it should be an effective outcome. So there were only, if you see here, so 1.3 millimeter in pubertal, and in pubertal, if you are doing functional appliances, the, the increase in the supplementary mandibular growth is 4.3 millimeter. So if you go through this sectogram, and we draw a line here, so anything below this sectogram are below less than two millimeter, which is which was the treatment was done before below the before the pubertal peak spurt. And this was done during the pubertal peak or after the pubertal peak. And this one increase in the length of the mandible was four to 4.5 millimeter. So timing is so important factor in treating patients with functional appliances. So the gist of this presentation of this article was the treatment of class two malocclusion at a pre-pubertal stage of development does not produce clinical significant supplementary elongation of the mandible average about 1.4 millimeter, which is nothing. So the treatment of class two malocclusion at a pubertal stage 
of development treatment, including the peak in the mandibular growth, produces a significantly growth of supplementary elongation of the mandible, average around four millimeters. Let's see Catherine. She was 12 years of two months of age. She was at the C3, which is peak of the pubertal growth spurt, and she was having an overjet of around 12 millimeters. We was treated with the twin block for 10 months and fixed appliances for one year, almost two years of treatment. And within 14 years, we got a beautiful profile and see from here, and we got a length increase in the supplementary length of mandible around 10 millimeters. This is the post-treatment at CS5. We started treatment at CS2. So the timing is so important factor in treating patients with functional appliances. Not only see, see the projection of the chin, how we have improved from here to here. And this can only happen if you treat the patients at the best possible peak of the pubertal growth spurt. So not only that, when you're treating patients at the functional jaw orthopedics at adolescent growth spurt, followed with the fixed appliances, the, the effective length of the mandible is more than three millimeter. And the treatment is shorter because the, the mandible is going to grow faster and the result will be faster so you, the, you can finish the whole treatment in two years as compared to if people start in the, in the early treatment, it, will, it leads to four years of treatment. And not only that, there will be optimal final intercuspitation at the end of the post-pubertal stage and there will be good stability. Now, what is the role of timing on long-term outcome of the class two treatment? So there's one clinical studies by uh, Faltin where he found out with the bionators that the actual length of the mandible which increase in five millimeter in long-term evaluations. To summarize the timing, we come on the stage of skeletal maturity in class two patient, treatment timing can influence the effectiveness of treatment on mandibular growth. Timing at puberty is better. Use a reliable indicator of individual skeletal maturation. Puberty involves problems with compliance. So fixed functional appliance can be a good choice for teenagers who are not compliant. Let's talk about the individual patient responsiveness. This is the fifth dimension of the dentofacial orthopedics. So the amount of supplementary growth of the mandible when compared to the untreated class two control varies widely among studies and within the same study as well. So there's the individual variability in the responsiveness to functional jaw orthopedics. Now the question is asked in subjects presenting with the same malocclusion and the same level of compliance treated at the same optimal timing and the same appliance in the hands of the same orthodontist can produce very different outcomes. Why it happens? Can we identify ideal candidates for the functional jaw orthopedics? So there are two cephalometric variables which we identified are significantly useful to identify ideal candidates for functional jaw orthopedics. The first one is the mandibular angle from condylone gonion to mentone. And the second is nasion perpendicular to the, uh, uh, to the pogonion. And this particular length is very, very important. So what are the, so the, the smaller the COG and angle, the mandibular angle, the more indicated for functional jaw orthopedics. So any angle which is less than 123 degrees, they are ideal candidates for functional jaw orthopedics. Now regarding the larger Pogonian nasal, uh, uh, perpendic if you drive perpendicular, the length from the perpendicular to the Pogonian, if this dimension is more than seven millimeter, they are the ideal candidates for the functional jaw orthopedics. Just seeing you an example, Sara, she was 11 years and three months. She has a CS3 peak of the pubertal growth spurt and her mandibular angle is 118 degree. And from Pogonian to the nasal perpendicular, she was almost like 10 millimeters. So she is an ideal candidate for the functional jaw orthopedics. Within two years, we should get, and with the fixed appliances, nine months with twin block, and then with the fixed appliances, we got a increase in the mandibular length around 10.5 millimeters. And see how the projection of the chin improves from here to here. Why it has happened? We started this patient at the correct possible time at, at the same time, we improve the profile as well as increase the mandibular length. So the factors for improving the effectiveness of class two treatment are two. 
timing of the treatment, we should start at the peak in the mandibular growth and mandibular morphology. We should take into account the mandibular angle and the distance from the nasal and perpendicular to the pogonion. These are the two angles were important. So let's talk about the growth of the maxilla. We will touch a little bit about the maxilla before I go to the appliances. So to summarize that, the pre stage is very good for mid palatal or teric, or if you want to do an, any kind of um, expansion or face mask treatment for the maxilla, the mid palatal and pterygomaxillary sutures are active. Whereas the pubertal uh, state is very good, is accelerated for the functional appliances. And after this, of course, there's a downgrade and the, the growth is completed. So pre pubertal is good for the the, the maxillary, rapid maxillary expansion, face mask, class three treatment, and pubertal peak spurt is an excellent for the, for the condylar growth, which is accelerated at that particular time. So this is a very important slide. I have put a summary of the whole work done by so many people. Class two patients at the pubertal growth spurt with severe mandibular retrusion affecting the profile and with a small mandibular plane angle. So pubertal growth spurt, CS3, then the mand mandibular angle less than 123, 123, always remember 123, and larger pogonian nasal perpendicular, the more than seven millimeter indicated for functional jaw orthopedics. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Okay. Now let's talk, so far we were talking about the mandible. Let's talk about the maxilla. What is the role of maxilla in class two treatment? What is the essential component for the routine treatment of patients with the class two malocclusion? The answer is expanding the maxilla. Now, if you see this patient, we just did a rapid maxillary expansion in a mixed dentition period, and the lower jaw moved forward automatically, improving the class two relationship. According to Jim McNamara, 60 to 70% of our orthodontic patients present with clinical indications for maxillary expansion. So this is a very, the maxilla is the template which controls the growth of the mandible. If you see on an average adult, the transpalatal width is 36 to 38 millimeter, whereas in mixed dentition is 33 to 35 millimeter. Whereas in the, if, if you find the, uh, the transpalatal width like 29 millimeter, you have to use a uh, rapid maxillary expansion. Once you expand this, you will have to retain it with the palatal plate and you will see the lower arch automatically, this uprighting of the posteriors takes place. So maxilla is always the template. If you see this particular, I always use, I'm a great fan of bonded expanders. I learned under Jim McNamara because I worked in the school. And when we use a bonded, bonded expander, there's always a little intrusion and, uh, and you will find the, after the expansion, the lower jaw moves forward and you will see the changes taking place. Uh, uh, in the in the position. So, so there's a sequence of events leading to spontaneous correction of the sagittal malocclusion. Pre-treatment, the patient has excessive overjet and an end-to-end -end malocclusion. The placement of the appliance immediately creates a downward rotation of the position of the mandible because of the posterior occlusal acrylic. During treatment, an intrusive and slightly protrusive force is produced on the skeletal and dental structures of the maxilla and during the post-expansion period, the upper dental arch has been widened. The lower jaw is postured forward to achieve a more stable occlusal relationship. In this illustration, brackets have been placed on the upper interior teeth to facilitate incisal position. I always give this example in my all lectures. So the, the shoe is like a maxilla and your foot is like a mandible. So when you have got a tight shoe, you go and buy a shoe and you tell the, the guy in the shopkeeper, give me one size bigger. So your, low, your foot moves, glides forward. It's same thing. So when you expand the upper jaw, the mandible slightly moves forward and you will see partial correction of the class two happens. Even if you do nothing, uh, activation with the functional appliances or anything else. So what are the effect of functional appliances? It postured the mandible forward. It accelerates the mandibular growth. It restricts the maxillary growth, headgear effect. It lingual tipping of the maxillary incisors, and there's a labial tipping of the mandibular incisors, and entire mandibular dentition. It's like a class two elastics effect. And there's a differential eruption of the posterior teeth, 
because we allow more of the eruption of the lower posterior teeth and we restrict the eruption of the upper posterior teeth. So there's a rotation of the occlusal plane and it affects speech and aesthetics. And there's a changes in the neuromuscular environment and function. And, and there are adaptive changes taking place in the glutenate fossa whenever we bring the lower jaw forward. So this with the changes with the activator plans, which was the first active functional plans. So what happens? Uh, the upper incisor retrocline, a point can move distally with the incisor roots to indicate an apparent maxillary skeleton change in the studies where A point is used to assess the position of the maxilla. And part of the overjet correction takes place because the Anderson plans has got a skeletal effect. The lower jaw moves forward, but there's increased evidence that any mandibular growth is not in excess with the genetically distinct. But if you see this activator appliance, we allow the eruption of the posterior teeth. Significant, there's increase in the lower facial height because of the eruption of the lower molars and premolars. And also studied by Sabina Roff and Hans Purchase, they have treated with the Anderson appliance that there's an increase in the effective vertical condylar growth compared with the acetate com templates of Bolton normals and a greater vertical movement uh, development of the chin takes place. So to summarize the changes with the activator, there's a retraction of the incisors, there's a flaring of the lower interiors, which happens with all the functional appliances, there's a more forward growth of the mandible because we are bringing it forward with the functional appliances and there's a downward growth of the, of the chin. So let's talk about the principles of functional therapy. First is the overbite correction, how the overbite correction takes place in the functional appliances. We limit the incisor eruption and we allow the differential eruption of the posterior teeth. Like in twin block, we always grind the upper bite block to allow the eruption of the posterior teeth. This is how the bite opening takes place. How we correct the overjet correction. There's the accelerated mandibular growth because of the, the, the activation which we have done with the functional appliances, whether it is a twin block or a bionator or an activator, or restricting the maxillary growth. And there's a maxillary incisor retraction when we are using any kind of functional appliances because the, there's a reciprocal effect and there is always some kind of proclination of the lower incisors, even if you don't want. So what happens when you bring the lower jaw forward, you bring a wider part of the lower jaw towards the, uh, the narrow part of the upper jaw, you always need coordination of the arches. So you need expansion of the maxillary arch to match the lower jaw with the constricted upper jaw. That's how in some of the very constricted arches, you have to use rapid palatal expander first before we switch over to the normal slow expansion with appliances like twin block. So what are the various type of functional appliances? You have a removal tooth bone appliances like activators, bionators, twin block. You have removable tissue bone like Frankel appliance. And then you have fixed uh, tooth bone appliances like Harps, Jasper jumper, forces, bite fixer, and there are so many more. The basic concept remains the same. Let's talk a little bit about the historical regulation of the functional appliances. The first one, the Norman Kingsley in USA, who gave the concept of the jumping the bite, he made an appliance uh, where he was trying to move. It's like it was having an Oliver guide plane, like an angle, and the lower teeth were used to move forward and stay there. But this went into disuse because the, the medieval never used to stay there, it goes back. And then came the classical work by Perry Robin, who gave us the concept of who designed the monoblock for children who were having the respiratory distress with cleft lip and palate and glossoptosis. And then this was the one piece appliance monoblock. He was from France. And then the Viggo Anderson, he was from Denmark. He used the appliance, which was made by Norman Kingsley. He used it for his own daughter who went for a summer vacation after the fixed appliances. And he was amazed to see that there was more growth of the lower jaw and the, the occlusion has become much better. And then he called this a work, he called this appliance initially as a, uh, what you call that, biomechanic working retainer. And then Anderson, who was in Denmark, he met with the Carl Hooper, who was a periodontist. They modified the biomechanic working retainer and they made it an activator. It was a loose appliance used to be used by the muscles and a one piece appliance and he called it an activator, which we call it Anderson activator. Then Harvard Woodside and Don Woodside, 
they increase the height of the uh, vertical height of the posterior bite block. He said there's more uh, cooperation compliance when you increase the height and also it improves the vert sagittal correction. And then there was so much of acrylic, the Balt Wilhelm Balters from Germany, he removed the acrylic and he made it a, he put more of the wire structures and made it a bionator. And then Rolf Frankel, who made the concept of functional regulators, Frankel appliance by lip pads and buckle pads, so that he said, remove the, uh, the stimuli, the, remove the all kind of stresses and you will find more of the expansion. So as patients who have a lot of muscle problems, functional regulator or Frankel appliance is the, is the appliance of choice. But for these days, we don't use it because complicated appliance, too much of wire work. And then Emil Hubst in 1905 made the Hubst appliance, which was reintroduced by Hans Penchurch in 1979, fixed functional appliance. And then there's uh, the jazz, jazz jumper. He made a soft tubing. The concept is the same, the fixed functional appliance for jumping the, the bike. If you see from United Kingdom, they are the, right from the time of normal Kingsley to monoblock, then Emil Herbst, activator, and then Bionator, Frankel, Herbst, twin block. And there are 130 years of the clinical experience of the twin block. How often do the functional appliances the people use? If you see in United States and Europe, the functional is used around less than 3% in USA and almost 20% in the Europe. Let's talk about the twin block blast. For those who don't know, me and Dr. Clark, we have been conducting courses together for the last 30 years. And we have written a book together, the latest edition of the book. And then this twin block appliance, one, one of the most patient friendly and the doctor friendly appliance. It was introduced by Scott Bill Clark in 1977 as a two piece appliance or a split activator using separate maxillary and mandibular appliances with occlusal acrylic portions that serve as inclined plane, guide planes, and the bite blocks to determine the extent that the mandible is postured downward and forward. So basically the twin blocks are essentially bite blocks that are essentially modify the occlusal inclined planes to induce favorably directed occlusal forces by causing a max mandibular displacement. The forces of occlusion are used to correct the malocclusion and it is aesthetic in nature, twin block. It is comfortable and efficient. It is 24 seven full-time wear. And if in, like in a patient who has got an overjet of around 17 millimeter premolars and in cross bite, and you can correct this in 11 months time by just this twin block appliance. Not only that, it changes your face because when you bring the jaw forward, you improve your breathing because your airway space improves. One of the most important thing of functional appliances is that me and Bill Arnett, we have been working together for almost 20 years on orthognathic surgery. And we have written a book together, me and Dr. Bill Arnett. So we have come out with the, there's a less risk of the sleep apnea when we bring the jaw forward, especially in the growing patients. So this is, we made a software where we can measure the amount of the airway which moves forward. This is one of the additional benefit other than the improved the facial profile, better occlusion in the improved airway and less risk of the sleep apnea. So let's talk about the twin block appliance. So there are various designs of the twin block appliance. I'm just talking about the major ones. If you go through the whole world, almost every second person has modified. So I'm talking about the original design of the Clark, then Jim McNamara's modification, Schwartz modification, Hubs modification. Then we are talking about the integration with the fixed appliances, fixed twin block. So this was the first appliance which was made by Bill Clark. These is upper. Uh, these are two appliances as we discussed. There's the bite blocks on that, and both meet each other at a 70 degree angle. The upper bite block is held by the Adam clasp or the Delta clasp or with the pin heads, and the lower is like a horseshoe shaped design with the uh, is held the retentum. Uh, Elements, either atoms or the or the pinheads. So this was the basic, and he also put a expansion screw in the middle. This was the standard design. So this is a very important slide to learn. 
So the height of the bite block determines the extent of the vertical opening and the inclination of the guide planes determines the extent of forward mandibular position. So the posterior vertical development, to gain posterior vertical development, the upper bite block is gradually released at each visit to allow for lower molar eruption. And the 70 degree interface bite ramps locks the mandible forward for class two correction. So if you see this, so one of the most important thing is that the minimum height in the premolar area should be not less than seven to eight millimeter. Otherwise, and it should be beyond the freeway space and uh, of the, because if your length of the, of the height is less, the patient will try to move your upper block over the lower block and create big open bites. And there will be never a correction rather than you will have big open bites. So this is a two piece appliance. You can put an expansion screw. And if you go to UK, you will see a lot of kind of T-springs, premolar screws and springs. I don't believe in that. It should be made very, very simple. So this is a 70 degree angle to the occlusal plane, which is very, very important. And then of course it should be made in the heat, heat cure acrylic. So uh, this is the, the clasp which we use. The reciprocal, there's a reciprocal encouraged for the expansion and there's a reciprocal encouraged for the sagittal correction because when we are moving the lower jaw forward, there is always a reciprocal force on the maxilla. And this is, and you can add the tubes if you want for high angle cases, if you want to addition. So what do we expect from turn blocks? It corrects your overjet correction because we are activating the lower jaw forward with a, with a bite uh, plane, which has, we have taken the bite in a forward position. And then we, we think in terms of overbite correction by we always trim the upper uh, bite block and we allow the eruption of the posterior teeth. And then the upper arch expansion with the help of uh, the uh, mid palatal screws and the upper arch may be retroclined because of the, the labial bows we use. And there's always some kind of proclination of the lower incisors, even if we don't want to simply further fix orthodontic treatment and is versatile for class two, div one, div two, and class three cases. Let's talk about the McNamara design. This is the design which I have been using for the last 20 years. So what he has done is he has decreased the, uh, the width of the, the bite blocks. We cover only two third of the posterior bite block and he uses two expansion screws. In the lower arch, he used a labial bow with a with acrylic, with like a spring aligners, we call it a spring aligner design. And, and then of course you have Adams and the label bow and 70 degree angle. He also extends the lower bite block till the molars because he sees that the one designed with the Clark is very, very flimsy and patient can sometimes eat the appliance because it is so small like a horseshoe shape. So Jim McNamara extends the acrylic till second molars, but it is no contact is made between the first and second molars. It is just for the sake of retention. So this is the McNamara design, two expansion screws. And sometimes he uses screws in the lower just to upright the posteriors. You can't expand the lower arch. And this is the design of the, and if you know about Kristen Mills, she's in Vancouver who has done a lot of work in twin block. Actually, there are a few people around the globe who has done a lot of work on the twin block. One is Kristen Mills, she's in Vancouver, Forbes Leishman in New Zealand, and then Bill Clark and myself. We have done a lot of work on the modifications of the twin block appliance. And then if you want to have an expansion of the arches, he, he puts in the upper and lower. And this is another design which Jim McNamara gave for people just to prevent the lower interior flaring, he covers the lower incisors. And one of the most important thing is that you have to leave at least one millimeter or two millimeter of space between the lower inclined plane and the embrasure between the second premolar and the molar or with the E and six, because sometimes this is the improper design, the, the, the technician will make appliance till this place, it will not allow the eruption of the posterior teeth. If you see the book of Dr. Bill Clark, he has made a lot of different kinds of designs he has made sagittal screws for class two, div two kind of a cases, three-way expansion, or he has uh, added many different kind of an expansion screws. And just if, if there's a div two kind of a case, I will prefer to go for a small six month treatment with the fixed appliances before we switch over to the fixed appliances. In UK, most of you should know that you can get blocks of the acrylic and then you can use those blocks to make the heat cure uh, this thing. 
So I'm adding one more concept. This is a sagittally guided twin block. This is from China, my friend. I had been teaching in China for many years. And this is a modified twin block. So what is the design? The upper, upper twin block is fixed, is bonded, and the lower one is removable. And this is how it works. And he put a rapid peltal expander. This is an inclined plane. And, the, and this is the, we move the lower jaw forward, the same consent of uh, uh, guide planes. So this is continue varying the twin block appliance. And another one from the same guy, he is using like a clear aligners and make a incline in the posteriors, uh, in the premolar areas, so that you can bring the lower jaw forward. This is like a uh, Invisalign, like the aligners, and you can have a design with the, uh, with the, uh, for the twin, for correction of the class two malocclusion. So what are the cases we should collect, select for the twin block appliance? It should be an actively growing patient, skeletal class two malocclusion with normal maxilla and mandibular deficiency, which is a retrognathic mandible, decreased lower facial height, and then dental velar maxillary incisors are protrusive and retrusive mandibular incisors, increased overjet and deep overwide and minimal crowding. You should have good arches. So a class two div one kind of a case where the arches are upper and lower arches are nice. A growing patient with a cooperative attitude increase in the overjet. And this is a kind of patient we should select for. This was an article by Jim McNamara who came over with the idea that the lower jaw is retruded in 70% of the class two cases. If 70% of the cases are retrusions, then why we treat the maxilla? So the key to proper treatment with functional appliances is the case selection. The regulation by McNamara and Moyes that approximately 80% of the class two malocclusions have retrognathic mandible is very clinically significant. If 80% of these mandibles are retrognathic, how can we continue to apply mechanics which cause the retraction of the, of the maxilla? So you can have an ideal uh, occlusion. You can have a teeth with the, the upper maxillary teeth are protruding. It is the mandibular deficiency. And then there's a downward and backward growth, the, the vertical growers of this thing. So there are three possibilities. One says you can bring the lower jaw forward with the, in a growing patient in a class two cases, or you can do camouflage by extraction of the premolars in an in adult or in adolescence patient where the growth is almost over or you can do orthognathic surgery to bring the lower jaw forward. So, so, so this is a very important slide to learn. So how do we judge this, this patient is, is a patient for functional appliance? So what you do is you ask the patient to bring the jaw forward. So if your profile improves, that means that patient is meant for the functional appliances. So the improvement in the facial profile on mandibular advancement provides a purview of the anticipated result, thus indicating a functional therapy. So this is the same concept that you just ask the patient to bring the jaw forward and the, uh, and the, so if you see this patient, this is before the treatment, this is we ask the patient to bring the jaw forward and this is the profile after finishing the case, you have almost brought the same simulated results which you anticipated before. So there's a crucial change of 11, in 11 months of treatment with the, with, the, with the twin block appliance here. So if you see, treat this patient, there's a closer change of 11, 11 months treatment for bringing the jaw forward. So I'm not going to discuss here because I already discussed for the timing of the treatment. But basically with the adolescence stage is the best stage when we start the treatment because the physical uh, when there's a peak of the pubertal growth spurt. One article which was by Bassetti about the treatment timing of twin block in AGADU, and he found out if we are starting treatment in the late, late mixed dentition or early permanent dentition produces more favorable effects that include the greater skeletal contribution to molar correction and large increments in mandibular length and ramus height and more posterior direction of the condylar growth. So the optimal timing is during or slightly after the onset of pubertal peak in growth velocity. So this is from my book in which we found out that during the adolescence, so basically the onset of the pubertal growth spot typically begins about 10 years in girls and approximately lasts for two years. And boys have a later onset, which is 12 years. The entire pubertal growth spot can last for four years. 
four to six years. So this we have already discussed for the cervical vertebra maturation method. So the peak of the pubertal growth spurt is the best time to treat patients with the twin block appliance. So class two patients, this is a very good slide. At the pubertal growth spurt with severe mandibular retrusion affecting the profile and with a small mandibular plane angle. These are the ideal candidates for functional jaw orthopedics. How do we get the success with the functional appliances? Because this is a removable appliance. You are depending on the patient compliance. So treatment timing, as we discussed, peak of the pubertal growth spurt, class two retrognathic mandible and horizontal growth pattern, patient compliance is one of the most important, easy to wear appliance, simple appliances should be used and appliance selection is very important. And twin block is a, is a very good appliance. Let's talk about the stages of the treatment. So the active phase of the twin block treatment is six to nine months, which is what it does in six to nine months. There's a reduction of the overjet. There's a correction of deep bite. There's a correction of distal occlusion and there's a transverse arch coordination. And once we have achieved and corrected the class two, then we have a sport appliance, which stays for three to six months till the posterior teeth, the premolars and molars are fully erupted and sport the corrected mandibular position while the buccal teeth settle fully into occlusion. And then for another six to nine months, we reduce the appliance with the sport appliance when the, when the posterior occlusion is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is stabilized. So how do we, let's talk about the clinical management of the twin block appliance. Number one, can you, are you hearing me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. So let's talk about the clinical management of the twin block appliance. Number one is the preparation of the dental arches, impression techniques, bite registration, appliance delivery, appointment scheduling, acrylic contouring, control of the vertical dimension, appliance reactivation, and the sport phase. So let's talk about the preparation of the dental arches. So if there are patients with a crowding or there's a slight protrusion or there's a spacing, I always suggest to have a short treatment with the fixed appliances and correct that, like you have a class two, div two kind of a cases, use appliances on the front interior teeth and the molars, just align the arches nicely so that the life becomes easy. If there's too much of protrusion or there's a spacing, you can close that spaces. You will come to know about the actual uh, overjet between the upper and lower arches. And this is uh, very, very important. So decomposition of the dental irregularities using the fixed appliances. So if there's a patient where the, rep the, mid the, uh, the rapid, if the mid transpalatal width is less than 30 millimeter, so then Rapid mental expansion prior to twin block therapy is very, very important if transpalatal width is narrow. So you should have four weeks of expansion, then two, six weeks appointment for the retainers of the rapid maxillary expansion. And then you take impressions for the twin block appliance. If your uh, maxillary transpalatal width is narrow, it's better to expand first. And of course, Schwartz appliance, this is Jim McNamara's concept where I don't believe much in expanding. You can't expand lower arch. You can upright the posteriors. So very important, you should have adequate extension in mandibular, in mandible necessary, transitional retainers. If you have done any kind of uh, intervention like a fixed appliances or something like this, and you have taken impression, you should make a small splint or uh, with a one millimeter thick splint with bioacrylic to hold the uh, arches in that position. Otherwise, when the appliance will come from the lab, it will never fit. So this is very important. And following the rapid maxillary expansion to twin block treatment, the expander can be worn as a removable retainer. So what you do is you remove the uh, expander after you are finished with that. After the retention period, take the impression and put back the same rapid maxillary expansion as the retainer. Otherwise, when the twin block comes from the lab, your twin block is not going to fit because there is always 20 to 30 percent of laps in all RME cases. So let's talk about the theories of advancements. This is uh, an area which I have written in the textbook of um, Dr. Bill Clark. So there are many theories. We will discuss all of them. One is an incisal edge to edge theory. If you have an overjet around 10, 10 millimeters, you can take the bite, you can uh, advance the bite to edge to edge. That's okay, it will work nicely. 
But if you have got a 15, 20 millimeter overjet, it's better to just do step by step, just extend firstly seven to eight millimeter. And the second step, either you can reactivate or you can make a new appliance. Another uh, third concept in the literature is 70% theory, which is the distance of the maximal protrusion path of the mandible. So what you do is you start with the, you ask the patient to close the mouth in centrical relation, and then you ask the patient to bring the jaw forward and measure the distance, the overjet. You take 70% of that, that much bite you have to activate. You bring the jaw forward in the initial stages. So what are the recommendations? Bite advancement, incisor edge to edge, up to seven to 10 millimeter, I think is fine. But the most important thing with my experience of 30 years in the twin block cases is that you should have at least seven to eight millimeter, millimeter of opening in the premolar region. It should be beyond the freeway space. Otherwise, while the patient child is sleeping, to appliance inside, it will fall back if your vertical height of the bite blocks is not good, or it will go back and there will be relapse. And you will find in many cases where the bite block height is not good, you will find one bite block over the other and there will be huge open bites at the back and no sagittal correction. And then you have to do aggressive reactivation after every two to three months uh, if when we bring the lower jaw forward. So I use a project bite gaze, which is available in USA and UK, ideal for the bite registration. So I use this uh, project bite for uh, registering the bite construction bite. So what we do is, so there are serrations on this. There are on one side, there are four serrations. On the other side, there's a one serration. So what, what uh, uh, these people suggest, uh, Bill Clark and others, he keeps uh, the one groove on the maxillary side and the other ones on the lower, but I use the other way around. I use one groove on the maxilla and the other ones on the, the, the other grooves on the, on the mandible. So this is how we use the construction bite. This is a project which is available from Great Lakes in USA lab and middle groove for the uh, for the edge to edge bite. We, in UK, they call it exacto bite. In USA, you call it project apply this thing. So the, the, it comes in two colors, uh, blue and white. Earlier it was blue and yellow. The blue, the interincisal distance is two millimeter, whereas the white, the interincisal distance is four millimeter. In most of the cases we use the blue one, the interincisal distance is two millimeter. When there's interincisal distance is two millimeter here, there's a two, uh, there is a, uh, there is a two millimeter between the uh, five to se seven to eight, seven millimeter in premolar area and two millimeter in the molar areas, clearance, edge to edge clearance. So the advantage of uh, using this project appliance is that you will use a correct, uh, correct bite registration. The other point which I want to give into information is the midlines. So what I do is I take a sketch pen and I draw the lines on the central incisors and the lower incisors, the where it is going. The, I draw the lines on the, on the incisors and the lateral incisors on both the sides. And then I ask and do exercise with the patient to bring the jaw forward and we'll see in which serration he fits best in the lower. And with the mirror, we do exercise almost 10, 15 minutes. When patient understands that when I will put a wax, he has to bite in this particular position. So this is a bite registration for up to 10 millimeter you will get absolutely correct bite with this. Then determination of the mandibular positioning. This is the end-to-end -end incisor relationship. Should not exceed seven to eight millimeters. The most of 10 millimeters is fine. Overjet where it's too large, we should do a stepwise progression is advocated. And when there's a labial tipping, we should always use a pre-functional appliance. Either we, we can have a labial bow and normal uh, removable appliance, or you can use a fixed appliance to correct that uh, spacing or protrusion of the teeth. And if there's a lingually placed lower incisors. This is for like an open bite cases, the yellow one, where the intercisor distance is four millimeters. And then, then uh, similarly, the posterior region, it in premolar will be down to eight to nine millimeters in the, in the posterior region, uh, the appliance. So this is how we use, we can use a wax after we have selected the serration uh, slot on both sides. And we ask the patient to uh, close properly and nicely. And then we get a three dimensional bite. 
So in deep bite cases, allow five to seven millimeter of, of, of opening in the, at least seven millimeter in the buccal segment in the premolar area. Blue, uh, blue project gives you two millimeter of incisal opening. But in open bite cases, we don't allow any kind of trimming. We, we don't want the posterior teeth to erupt. So we allow seven to eight millimeter or eight to nine millimeter opening in the buccal segment. So yellow or white project gives you four millimeter of incisal opening. So when the appliance comes from the lab, it should be fitting snugly with all the places. And you will be, you will be amazed to see that even after one week, patient will bring the mandible forward and they will be eating comfortably with the twin block appliance. Profile should vastly improve with the protruded mandible. So there's an open bite in the bicuspid area. Class one skeletal has been achieved with the maxillary mandible, idly uh, positioned. Original class two molar relationship has been corrected to class one molar relationship. So basically, once uh, we maintain the mandible in the sport phase, we make a sport appliance where we allow the eruption of the posterior bicuspids and molars. It takes four to six months required for the buccal teeth to erupt into occlusion. And the sport appliance is like a inclined plane where the incisors go fit in and interior inclined plane and we allow the eruption of the of the posterior teeth. It's like a uh, is like a labial bow anterior inclined plane and flat occlusal stop and add labial bow if required. So this is a labial bow added for the retention. So we talk about the scheduling of the appliance for when we give the appliance, we call the patient after two weeks, we start contouring. Contouring means we are going to remove at least one millimeter or one and a half millimeter of acrylic from the upper bite block to allow the eruption of the posterior teeth. And then after around six weeks, another six weeks, if, if the lower jazz come forward, we need to reactivate the appliance. Means reactivate means we add the acrylic on the upper interior portion. And then we keep on contouring every six weeks the appliance. And 26 weeks, we start with the maintenance appliance. And then we take impression for the stabilization. And then if the patient is in the permanent dentition, we can go for the fixed appliance. This is how we go for the trimming of the upper posterior appliance. But we have to make sure that you maintain the integrity of the 70 degree angle. If you touch with the 70 degree inclined plane, your whole concept of the tin block finishes. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, so slowly and slowly, we remove the acrylic from the top and then from the lower appliance. And trim away above a trim upper block by one to two millimeter. Don't uh, trim more than one to two millimeter. Otherwise the tongue will fit in. Continue trimming at each visit to allow low molars to erupt and lower molars erupt into the occlusion, finally trim the occlusal bite block. So we advance, if there's a class two, dip two kind of a case, I suggest to go for a small fixed appliance phase before you go that, and you can just trim the way I've explained to you. This is like a reverse, like a class three type of a malocclusion. It goes reverse of the, like a class two malocclusion. In cases with, with their open bites, you don't need to trim. Rather, it acts like a vertical correctors you will find the ANS, PNS line. There's the intrusion of the, the palatal plane in these kind of patients. Even in the normal twin block, there's a little intrusion. So it covers all except the upper incisors and we allow the incisors to erupt and we don't allow. You can add the vertical pull headgear if you need. And this is how we treat the patients. Bill Clark has advised to use elastics in open bite cases, vertical elastics to intrude the posterior teeth. And this is the anterior open bite is reduced and distal occlusion is corrected in these kind of patients. Let's talk about the reactivation of the twin block appliance. So we have to add acrylic after two to three months. Once the lower jaw moves forward and you have an overjet of 14 millimeter or 16 millimeter, you can add acrylic every two to three months. You can use either a cold cure acrylic, which you have to be added in the lab, but we should not waste time. So very good thing is, tried from dent supply. This comes in small blacks. Uh, this sets very fast in the light. So you make small balls and use a burr and make this rough and then add a ball and just give it a shape. And after sh giving a shape, just check how much you want to add and then cure it and then polish it. Make sure that the new portion and the old portion, they submerge with each other. So this is reactivate every two to three months. And there's another concept by the fresh student they use this kind of a screws in the upper 
has to reactivate the appliance or you can have a, this kind of a screw with the fresh student to advance the, uh, they put it on the upper bite block to bring the lodge, activate the appliance. So patient instructions, you have to wear appliance 24 seven, contact if problems, remove for cleaning or for sports or swimming, saliva increases temporary, teeth together at all the times and turn screw up expansion screw one per week. And in patients who are in late mixed dentition or there where there's a problem of a retention, you can use a, uh, like a, well, I don't believe in this, but this was the concept of Bill Clark. He uses a glass inomer cement or a, some kind of an acrylic in the lower atom clasps to hold it so that the patient get used to the, uh, to the uh, uh, compliance improves. So either he uses a composite or some kind of a cement to fix the uh, bite blocks for two weeks so that the compliance improves. So let's start with the clinical cases now. The first patient is Michelle. She is 12 years of age. She has got retrognathic mandible, convex profile, low facial height, and she's 12 years of age. And this is the upper incisors are protruding. And this is the, the occlusion, if you see. There's a marked increase in the overjet. And there's upper arch is constricted. So these are the kind of cases which is uh, with the, which we should treat with the twin block patients. So if you see this cephalogram, she has got an overjet of 17.5 millimeters. A and B is eight degree. Maxillary mandibular plane angle is 20 degree. This is a horizontal growth pattern. And then these are the upper incisors flared 130 degree, lower incisors 104 degree IMPA. So these are the cases which are ideal for the twin block patients. So after nine months with post twin block, so we improved the profile with nine months, we brought the jaw forward and this is the occlusion after nine months. We brought the lower jaw forward and then we just gave uh, the A and B reduced to three, overjet reduced to 5.5 and upper incisors. And then we just A and B and see the up maxillary. And one of the most beautiful thing to remember, see the maxillary mandibular plane is 16. It means there is intrusion of the maxilla of the ANS because of the bite blocks. And lower incisors, of course, always flare. This is the post twin block after this in this patient. And this is superimposition with the uh, pre-treatment and the, and the twin block. Then we give a refinement with the fixed appliances treatment, close all the gaps, close the spaces. And then within a period of two years, we finish the case, beautiful profile, elongation of the we have got increased the posterior facial, anterior facial height, and the profile is improved, and the occlusion is improved, and this we treat, treated in, in two years, exactly, post-treatment. So the overjet, this is the post-treatment, is overjet is 3.5 millimeter, uh, A and B is 2.5 degree, and this is from post-twin block to end of the treatment, and this is the overjet in the end is around two millimeters, and A and B is almost, and this is, from here, we, we have moved it to here. See the, how the profile improves. So these are the cases, if you treat at the right time, peak of the pubertal growth spurt with twin block appliance, you can do wonders. And what is the, just the summary of the cephalometric norms, and it was pre-treatment, A and B was eight, and we brought it to 2.5, and maxillary mandibular plane angle, 22.5 to 15. And we ret retracted the upper incisors, and of course, we limited the, protrusion of the lower incisors. That is very important. One of the side effects of the all functional appliances of the protrusion of the lower incisors, which we have to take care. This was a uh, Libyan girl, which I treated when I was working with the government of Dubai. I was head of the department for government of Dubai for 20 years. And uh, so this was Nur al Huda, 11 years of age. And what I have found in my experience, you know, what is the pubertal growth part in the girls when you still have ease? And you see there, uh, this is peak of the pubertal growth part. You see the concavity in C3 and C4. So she is almost at the peak of the pubertal growth part, nine millimeter of overjet. And this is the, I wanted to show you and share with you the, the design which I use in my 90% of my patients. This is the McNamara's design, two expansion screws. We extend the lower twin block till the molars. And this is the design which I use. And there's a anterior labial bow in the lower, like a, 
like uh, aligners. We use it like a uh, spring aligners, which we use in the lower interiors. And this is the kind of appliance which we use. Within four months, we brought the lower jaw forward almost uh, no overjet. And this is, uh, then this becomes like this. If you see the lateral stuff, we brought the lower jaw forward within, I think, three to four months, nine millimeter overjet and from here to here. And then we gave a short phase of sport appliance. This is an ideal picture of the sport appliance, which I use because sport appliance should be such that the lower incisors go into that till the posterior teeth fully erupted. And then I gave a nine months treatment with the fixed appliances. And this is how we, we finished the case. There's improvement in the post-treatment profile. So this is how we, this is the finished product with the post-treatment. Let's talk about Kara. She is 12 years, five months old. And she, uh, there is a, uh, she has got a convex profile, retruded mandible, but she came to me at the right age. Upper arch is little constricted, lower arch is contained. And so this is post twin block. So uh, you find typically open bites in the premolar areas. And always remember one thing, which I teach in my courses of twin block. Always take your models, bring your lower jaw forward and see the relationship of the premolar and canine area. If your upper arch is constricted very badly, go for rapid palatal expander first because the kind of slow expansion which you get with tin block is not sufficient for you to get that much of uh, expansion in the maxilla because you need a good amount of expansion is very, very important. So this is post twin block. And then this is a sport appliance. And then we course of the twin uh, fixed appliances for a year. And this is how we finish. So this is, this is how we finish the profile. And this is, if you see the summary of this patient, we brought the A and B from six to three and maxillary mandibular plane angle is almost maintained at 29. This is an interesting case. This is the three second bicuspids are missing and we treated with the, with the twin block plan. She is the daughter of one of my colleagues who was the medical director in Rashid Hospital. She was a Jordanian girl with a, with a uh, retreated mandible. But what I, we always learn from our experiences. I started this case at 10 years, nine months. Uh, of course, late mixed dentition is one of the indicators, but I always feel, feel early permanent dentition is the best time. So because you take longer time to finish the case, we should take efficiency is very, very important that how fast you can finish the case. So this is three premolars are absent. One premolar I extracted to simulate that. And then this is 10 year, nine months. And this is uh, A and B is nine degree. And the uh, FMA is 23 degree horizontal growth pattern. So within six months, we brought the lower jaw forward so if you if you trim too much the posterior bite block, the tongue will get in and will not allow the teeth to erupt. This you have to take into consideration when you are trimming the upper bite block. We brought the lower jaw forward, and then we switch over to the fixed twin block, uh, the fixed appliances, and refine the occlusion. And this is 14 year three months, and this is how the profile has improved. If you see this patient. This is post-treatment. So I'm not going into detail in the cephalometrics. So this is pre and this is post-treatment results. This is pre and post-treatment. This is pre and post-treatment. And this is 10 year, nine months, 11 year, nine months, and then 14 year, three months. So I saw this patient after four years of finishing and we have seen such an improvement in the, in the occlusion. The teeth have settled down nicely and the profile has improved. The profile improved immensely. So this patient is 11 year, nine months old and retreated mandible. She's a little high angle. So here in this case, I use the classical design out Dr. Bill Clark. One expansion screw covering the whole occlusal areas because in, uh, if you see the McNamara design, he only covers the occlusal surfaces only two thirds. He leaves the occlusal surfaces of the upper bite block one third, so adjusting the clasp and makes the appliance less bulky. 
So this is the classical design of the of Dr. Bill Clark, and this is progress after six months, and then we just refine the occlusion, and this is how we reach to 13 years. So this is the um, uh, this is the um, with the normal twin bulk. If you see a patient like this, which has got an overjet of around 20 millimeter. So how you are going to treat? Now these are the patients I treated with the twin block appliance from uh, this. But if you see such an arch to start with, you have to firstly go for the rapid peltal expander and then go for the twin block appliance. And this is how the profile improves from here to here. These are very severe cases. And if you see this out of retention, how much growth of the lower jaw has taken place. And this is 11 year, eight months, 12 year, four months, and 23 years, eight months, how the profile improves. So when you are switched over from the twin block to the fixed appliances phase, still you have to make the surgical correction. So firstly, your, the sport appliance is still working. When you remove the sport appliance, you have to switch over to the short class two elastics. Very, very important. It's simple, easy, allows rapid transition between the functional and fixed phase of the treatment. So majority of the patients make the transition with this steep and deep bite plane. This is continued in the fixed phase until the stainless steel arch wires are placed. At this stage, class two elastics are started and the steep and deep bite plane is discontinued. Fixed appliances may be fitted before, during the twin block to level and align the arches. Full lower fixed appliances may be fitted during the sport phase to level and align. Simple twin block may be integrated with the fixed appliances like a utility arch in the lower or brackets in the upper interiors and blight, bite blocks in this thing. Like this is, you can integrate in the interior, you can put the braces and then you can use a utility arch in the lower and you can use a bite block along with the fixed appliances, which is the, is the integration of fixed appliances with the twin block. Or in a case like Div 2, where you can just put the fixed appliances first and before we switch over to the twin block. In certain cases, like this is from Forbes Leishman from New Zealand, and he adds the twin block along with the fixed appliances, the different design, and he keeps it forward. And this is how he brings the lower jaw forward. He just, he said to be more efficient, beautiful development of the arches. And this is how we bring the the lower jaw forward. So basically there's a, what is the effect of twin block? It increases in the mandibular length. There's a significant increase in both interior and posterior facial heights. Slight inhibition of the forward maxillary growth, maxillary incisor retrusion and mandibular incisor proclination, which is a side effect. Distalization of the maxillary molars in few cases, extrusion of the mandibular posterior buccal segments. So how do the 20 to 30 percent is the skeletal effect, and 70 to 80 percent is the tooth tipping, dental velar changes. Majority of the correction is therefore brought about by tipping of the teeth rather than the skeletal chain. So, if you see this diagram, effects of the twin block appliance on the skeletal and dental velar structures, the clinical views showing the typical appearance of the occlusion at the end of the twin block phase of the of the treatment. So, this is how the pre-treatment and then the post twin block uh, case. So this is from, this article was published in AGODO by Kristen Mills. She is in Vancouver and with whom I have also worked for several years. And this is uh, how we, uh, the, the growth of the mandible takes place. And he, she came out with the conclusion in this article that the mandibular unit length increased nearly three times as much the twin block as compared to the controls, number one. Approximately two thirds of the increase can be attributed to the increase in the mandibular ramus height. The twin block appliance can achieve substantial skeletal improvement in young growing class two fish individuals. Much of the skeletal improvement is related to the in increase in mandibular length and those changes are for the most part stable three years post treatment. So what can go wrong in the transitional phase? There can be increase in the overjet there can be relapse of the molar correction. Then the itogenic anterior open bite, persistent lateral open bite is one of the side effects of the twin block plans because of the blocks and then exhausted patient cooperation. So how we uh, correct this? 
You can use deep and deep bite plane, which we use as port appliance. Sometimes you can use a part-time twin block with little modifications. Trimming of the twin, uh, trim, twin block, and you can use a headgear, class two elastics, simultaneous wear of twin block and the fixed appliances. Prevention of overjet increase, they really do not need to be steep and deep to be effective at this stage of the treatment. Allow closure of the lateral open bites by the sport appliance and allow assess for the placement of the fixed appliance. You can start with the fixed appliance in the lower arch when we are using the sport appliance. Retentive and comfortable for the patient. So this is a kind of a sport appliance which we use. So what is the aim of the fixed appliance treatment? Uh, phase of the treatment. The aim of the fixed appliance phase of the treatment is to refine the occlusion and to produce good interdigitation of the buccal segments. It is often necessary to correct the over tipping of the teeth that is occurred during the twin block phase of the treatment. So what happens, what are the effects of the twin block? It leads to the retroclination of the upper incisors because you are using a kind of a, some kind of a labial bow. It leads to the proclination of the lower incisors, which is one of the side effects of when we are doing the sagittal activation. It leads to the buccal tipping of the maxillary posterior teeth when we are using an expansion screw. And it leads to the production of the lateral open bites. So these are the side effects of the twin block phase. So what does the fixed appliance does? The palatal root talk of the upper incisors following the retroclination during the twin block phase. Labial root torque of the lower incisors following their proclination during the twin block phase and buccal root torque in the maxillary buccal segments during, following the buccal tipping during the expansion of the midline screw. Maintenance of the overjet correction achieved during the twin block phase of the treatment. So the MBT pres pres prescription which we use for post twin block treatment is basically incisor torque, posterior torque, incisor tip and posterior tip. Let's talk one by one. The incisor torque for the upper central incisors increased to 17 degrees in the MBT prescription. This extra incisor torque is useful to correct the palatal tipping of the incisors during the twin block phase. So the torque value in the lower incisor is minus six degrees in the MBT prescription. This increased label root torque is helpful in correcting the proclination of the lower incisors that tends to happen during the twin block phase. The posterior torque value for the upper first molar is minus 14 degrees this increased amount of buccal root torque is helpful in correcting the buccal tipping of the posterior teeth that occurs as a result of upper arch expansion with the twin block midline screw. Maintaining the overjet reduction, the MBD prescription on initial placement of fixed appliances following overjet reduction with the twin block appliance, there is tendency for the overjet to increase because of the tip. This is in part due to expression of the mesial tip in the prescription of the most pre-adjusted appliances this undesirable overjet increase can be partially reduced by the placement of lace backs. The tip value in the interior posterior brackets of the MPT prescription is very low, and that is also helpful. So the interior tip values for the upper label segment are reduced. This reduces the tendency for the overjet to increase during the fixed phase. And this is the posterior tip, 17 degree torque, 10 degree torques, minus seven on the premolars, minus 14 on the molars, and the tip is only four, eight, eight, Zero, 0 on the premolars and on the molars. And the posterior, the tip value for the upper posterior teeth are zero degree. This helps to prevent mesial tipping of the upper buccal segment teeth. This in turn helps to conserve the encourage gain during the functional phase of the treatment. And the posterior tip lower arch, this value helps the lower premolars is two degree tip. This encouraging a small amount of mesial tipping of the lower buccal segment. This in turn helps to maintain the correction of the buccal segments achieved during the functional phase. So what are the advantages of the twin block treatment? This is a comfortable appliance and a patient friendly appliance. It is a simple and robust and flexibility of design is there. Patient can speak and patient can eat. Facial, um, there's a rapid correction of the overjet. Patient feels the difference in the profile improvement. And there's a very easy for the clinical management you, the arch development is very easy with the twin block appliance and you can integrate with the fixed appliances. And in cases there, there's a problems with the TM joint because of the bite, it, this will also help. You can incorporate in high angle cases, the head cares in certain cases. Patients like them, they are initially very retentive. They wear 24 seven expansion alongside the sagittal correction, looks instantly improved, but can still speak. 
easily reactivated modifications possible and slowly incorporates the fixed. Areas of special concern, patient cooperation is very important. That is for any removable appliance. Lower incisor proclination is another area which we have to look into. Excessive lateral open bite, aggressive trimming. We should never trim more than one to 1.5 millimeter in each sitting. And insufficient height of the bite block. This is the worst thing. If your height is less than seven to eight millimeter in the premolar area, one block will go over the other block and create big open bites. And there will be never a sagittal correction rather than there will be worst uh, progress. Relapse during the transition phase if you are not using the, the appliance. So this is, um, of course, I'm not discussing the fixed twin blocks. So this I've discussed the, the twin block appliance. So are you with me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So when we are talking about, now this is how much time I've taken now? This is now 8.22. So if we are talking about the fixed functional appliance, the forces appliance, it will take another one hour. Should I go ahead? Uh... I think so, sir. We would be fine with this. Uh, okay. So then uh, we can go with the next sitting. The yes, forces, sir. Forces, this is a very nice fixed functional appliance because, you know, then we have come, come out with the new designs of the tw fixed twin blocks, but it needs time. So we can divide the lecture into three parts if you want. If you want, I can continue with this. It will take another one hour. or we should stop here. Uh, Dr. Preeti? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yes. It was a wonderful presentation, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll carry on with the, your presentation in the next session also, sir, at your time okay. convenient to you. So since I've already prepared, can you fix up the time now? Because this is a fixed Anytime, function. Whenever appliance. you are ready, sir. Whenever you are ready. No, I, I, I am ready because uh, it's yes, two I, hours. I, know, I understand, sir. Uh, so we just you can fix up. You, you yes, can sir. fix up sir, the we'll, time. Yes, sir. Yeah. We'll get back to you, sir, and we'll fix up the time, and we can have your uh, next schedule with the no, because, uh, principal, sir. We'll fix up the time, sir. Please, please. Okay, no problem. So we can start with the fixed functional appliance at the next sitting. Maybe yes. we'll, next... Ramesh will fix up time and, and let you know. Okay, no problem. So is there any questions asked yeah, by the sir, audience? There, there are two questions in the question answer section uh, and one in the chat box also. Dr. Preeti, would you please like to moderate the question answer section? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is one question from uh, Dr. There is one question from Dr. Bennett, Bennett yes. Babu. Huh. Sir, which is a recent fixed functional appliance and which is cost effective among them and most effective one? The most effective and patient friendly and doctor friendly appliance. And the recent fixed functional appliance. This is the forces appliance. The best appliance today out of all the fixed functional appliances simple to adjust, simple, uh, co comfortable for the patient and fast results. So this is most effective appliances, the forces appliance, fixed functional appliance. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Any other question? I think so, ma'am. There's a question in the chat box also. One question is there in the chat. I'll, I'll just check, sir. So there is a question from Jeff. How do we choose one functional appliance over the other <coughs> and what's the criteria? Okay. It's so, a quite... No, it's, it's, it's a good question. So if the, if the uh, patient is having a retrognathic mandible, lower facial height, and patient is cooperative, then the twin block appliance is the best appliance. In patients, those who are having uh, non-compliant, or the teenagers, sometimes they don't wear the appliance, then you can think in terms of the fixed functional appliance like the forces appliance. But some patients, those who have got a lot of muscular problems, there's a stretch of the muscles involved. Then in good old days, we used to use a Frankel appliance, but I have stopped using Frankel appliance for last 
I think 20 years, I have not used it because of it is very complicated appliance, both for the patient as well as for the doctor. But it has got the maximum skeletal effect, you know, for the, uh, for the patient. So if the patient is compliant, twin block is the best removable functional appliance. If the patient is, is not compliant, then we think in terms of forces appliance, the fixed functional appliance. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, there is one more question. Uh, sir, please explain regarding the height seven millimeter and what mm. happens if it is less and what is its significance? All right, it's a very good question. So if your height is less of the twin block, number one, there are many things. Uh, if the height is less then the patient while sleeping or otherwise, he will put, if the height is less, let's say three, four millimeters. So it will, he will bring one block over the other and there will be no sagittal correction because the 70 degree angle concept finishes and he will have just lateral open bias and the correction will not take place. This is number one. Number two is, it should be minimum seven to eight millimeter in the premolar area. If you have got a, this much of bite block, it is easy for you for bite correction when we reduce because you have to increase the lower facial height and you have to flatten the curve of SP. You can only do that if you have got good height of the bite blocks. This is number two. You should always go beyond the freeway space or the resting length of the muscles. If you know the, the freeway space is around three to four millimeters, you add another five to six millimeter to that. That is the concept. Uh, uh, this is how, if there's a stretch, then only the, the twin block appliance works. If, you are, if your height in the premolar area is less than seven to eight millimeter, it's a fertile exercise. It should be for a horizontal growth patterns, two millimeter interincisal, seven to eight millimeter in the premolar area and two millimeter in the molars areas. These are very, very important. It should be blown. You won't get stretch of the neuromuscular muscles. The, you should be, it should be beyond the freeway space. Otherwise, the, while sleeping, the appliance will fall back if your height is less. Okay, thank you, now, sir. There is one, one more question from Mandeep Shilpi. Sir, how much advancement we have to plan at the time of appliance delivery by keeping in mind that there will be late mandibular growth? Okay. So you have to go by the overjet which you have in, in, in that particular moment when you have taken the records of the patient. If the overjet is around 10 millimeters, you can go inside that edge to edge. No, you can bring the jaw forward to edge to edge. If your overjet is more than 10, 15, 20 millimeters, then you... Firstly, make an appliance, activate the appliance for 10 millimeter bite registration. And then subsequently, either you can reactivate the appliance by, add, uh, by, or by adding the acrylic or reactivating the appliance in the upper bite inclined plane, or you can make a new appliance if your overjet is around 20 millimeters. So I had a patient which has got an overjet of 20 millimeters. So I made the twin block twice or thrice. And sometimes, but if there's a two to three millimeters, more required, you can reactivate it, add acrylic in the upper inclined plane. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. There is one more question from Gaurav Patil. Is there any rule of 10 for registering bite in case of twin block? Please guide. Say again. Is there any rule of 10 for registering mm -hmm. bite in case of twin block? As I explained to you, so if there is an overjet around 10 millimeters, we should go for edge to edge registration. If there's a overjet of more than 10 millimeter, like 12 meter, 15 millimeters, then you should activate or take the budget registration bite firstly till 10 millimeters. Then in the second sitting, you can reactivate it or make another bite block, another um, appliance. So you can do either way. If it is only two, three millimeters, you can activate it. And you should not activate more than twice because every time, you activate around two to three millimeters. Okay, sir. Can we take a few more questions, sir? Sure, as many you want. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, Priti, yes. ma'am. Yes, yes. I've got few hands raised. Yeah. Can we take up them live questions? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I would like to request the audience who are putting up uh, anonymous uh, questions. Please uh, don't put uh, anonymous question. You're doing a great job. We can. We would like to acknowledge you. Uh, 
here it is shalini tomar uh, you can uh, ask your questions directly shalini tomar you there shalini uh, ma'am uh, she is not there you can go ahead please so there is uh, one question please explain the trimming of the appliance again i think sir has already explained that okay anyway so what we do is when the appliance comes from the lab firstly we check that the retention the retentive clasp like the adam or the bulk clasp are fitting nicely uh, the appliance is not uh, sharp at any ends we have to make sure it is comfortable for the patient and we have to tell the patient that it will be little difficulty in speech and in saliva for first few days and within a week or 10 days the patient get used to it so when we normally i call the patient after two weeks after one week just for checking that everything is fine nothing is hurting you or the appliances is not loose is very important yes your adam class or bulk class are nicely adjusted then after two weeks we we trim the upper bite block 1 to 1.5 mm we should not uh, we should not uh, do it more because if you trim more the tongue will get in and the the sagittal correction will not take place that will be a big problem so that is another problem so so we should not trim more than 1 to 1.5 mm we keep on trimming but while trimming you have to see you don't touch the anterior inclined plane because that is your mechanism of correction that is the 70 degree angle don't go closer to that leave that area free like a wedge small wedge in the interior so only the pre, the the molar areas you keep on trimming or the second premolar area you can trim in the premolar area don't to come to that area because you have to keep the 70 degree angle the sagittal corrections once you have seen that and another thing which i can tell you you can use a separators in the lower arch which i do on routine basis when i start trimming i put separators in the lower molars for one week we remove the uh, separators and then we the it is easy for the molars to erupt because the contact points are very tight other thing which you can do is some bill clark has done and uh, forbes lishman has done is this put small hooks on the upper appliance or some kind of hook on the upper appliance and then they use vertical elastics to allow the fast eruption of the lower molars put like a lingual buttons in the lower vertical elastics so these are the ways i i always use the separators in the lower posteriors and we allow the eruption of the posterior teeth it helps and once you have trimmed the upper quite a bit then you start trimming of the lower uh, uh, premolar area from inside so that the lower premolars start erupting but always maintain the integrity of the 70 degree angle very important because if your 70 degree angle is gone your sagittal correction will not take place so slowly and slowly we trim and once you have seen uh, remove the appliance see uh, after 6 months or so actually 5 to 6 months you are able to achieve everything if you are not able to correct class 2 malocclusion 10 mm overjet in 6 to 8 7 months it means you are not aggressive enough there is something wrong with your approach very important so 10 to 12 mm overjet 6 to 8 months you should finish and start over to the sport appliance sometimes it also depends on the compliance of the patient how the patient is wearing the appliance we in the uk or in usa we give a uh, uh, we have got a small book we call it a twin block book where patient says he is wearing the appliance from this time to this time this time to this time we only ask the patient to take out the appliance while eating or while brushing and while eating we should always encourage to wear the appliance very very important so these are the uh, we and we have got a progress sheet for twin block where every visit when patient comes we see how much is the overjet how much is the expansion you have achieved all those parameters you have to put in your progress sheet is very very important so trimming as far well as is concerned on each visit should not exceed 1 to 1.5 mm it's a gradual process till you keep on watching the eruption process of the lower molars and then we go over to the lower bite block trimming and then ultimately we switch over to the sport appliance once the the class 2 correction has taken place hello yes 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 sir 
So there is a, a question from Mahak Gupta. Sir, sure. how to check for Terrigard response after delivering the appliance? Yes. So what happens once you put this appliance class two character or the twin block appliance, your muscles, there's a chain in the neuromuscular mechanism. Your condyle is out of the fossa and it comes forward. The muscles starts getting reorganized. There is a more activation of the little uh, pterygoid muscles. There's a restriction of the, on the maxillary growth. So what happens, any kind of a functional appliance where we bring the lower jaw forward, there's a stimulation of the lower jaw. There's a little pterygoid effect. You feel when you ask the patient after one week also, uh, you see the profile has improved. When he closes the mouth, he brings his lower jaw forward. This is a, like a neuromuscular mechanism that which just starts. Later on, it changes, the skeletal changes take place in months or years. It takes time. It happens. We call it a pterygoid effect. Sir, un uh, sir unmute. Hello. Naik, sir, please unmute. Uh, sir, there is a question. Sir, there is question. Please. Yes, sir. From uh, Dr. Saurabh Agrawal, there is a question. Sir, kindly explain the extension of inclined planes in both upper and lower uh, blocks as originally designed by Clark. Very good. So when uh, 1977, when Clark started this appliance, I don't, I don't know whether you know it, that how it started and how this appliance was invented. It was for his one of his colleagues, his son fell down and the upper incisors became loose and he wanted an appliance where the, the lip are not touching the upper teeth. So first, first inclined plane, he made 90 degree. Then he switched over to the 45 degree. And ultimately we came to the 70 degree incline. When you put a 70 degree incline, there's more horizontal growth of the lower jaw. So this is by heat and trial, we found out that the 70 degree ang angulation is the best angulation for the horizontal growth of the mandible. Thank you, sir. There is a question from Gagandeep Kocher. Good evening, sir. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Which is the best method to reduce lower incisor proclination as incisal clapping, label acrylic facing, and ball end clasp on lower anteriors have been shown to be ineffective with present literature? Okay. So basically, we are using the, the labial bow and with the, uh, the spring aligner design. And uh, if, uh, as I explained to you earlier, if you have got a patient where the lower incisors are already flared or there is a spacing in the uppers, I always believe, firstly, go for a short course with the fixed appliances so that you know the actual overjet, how much is the actual overjet. And once you want to reduce the lower interior flaring, you can use a labial bow, you can use a hubs type of appliance, capping the lower incisors. But whatever you do, there is always a, you know, because it is a reciprocal encourage. When we are activating the appliance, we are, when the lower jaw is moving forward, the pressure goes to the lower interior teeth. But all these things, the, the, the ball clasp, the labial bow with spring aligner designs, or sometimes we even like a hubs design, which I've shown you, it prevents the lower interior flaring. But I have seen with my experience and with Dr. Bill Clark and Jim McNamara, that there's a rebound of the lower incisor flaring. After the, your activation, your class two correction is there, already three to four degree, your lower incisors go back. So after your treatment is over, you, go, so you switch over to the sport appliance, this is a rebound of the lower interior flaring. Okay, sir. So there all these methods can be used. Yeah, okay, thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question from Vanashri. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, sir. What would you advise for the treatment of class two division one cases with constricted lower arch? You know, in constricted lower arch, if you can use a, if there's a light, mild crowding and their arches are constricted. Of course, the lower arch is always constricted but the upper arch is constricted. So you have to use a rapid peltal expander in the upper and you can use a Schwartz appliance in the lower to upright the lower posteriors and give some space for the lower incisors to get into alignment. So that's uh, Jim McNamara, uh, actually he uses a lot uh, because I, you cannot expand the lower arch but you can upright the lower posteriors to gain a little bit of space. 
Uh, but whenever you will expand the upper arch, there's always the uprighting of the lower posteriors, and that also helps. Okay. Thank you, sir. There is a question from Ramya TC. Sir, how effective are double cantilever springs in correcting the standing lateral incisor when incorporated in front block applied? Say again the question. How effective are double cantilever springs in correcting the standing lateral incisor when incorporated in twin block applied? So I don't believe in this like a class two, div two kind of a cases. We always um, corrected this the fixed appliance face with a short treatment of three months. We align the incisors firstly before we take impressions for the twin block appliance. Because uh, putting too many kind of springs, you can have T springs, you can have any kind of number of springs or expansion screws, but it makes the appliance uh, less, uh, you know, uh, retentive. So we should um, uh, life should be more made simple. So I feel that have a short case of fixed appliances. Align your arches nicely before you go to the twin block treatment. Sir, there are some couple of questions on YouTube also, sir. Can we sure. take it up, sir? Please, please. Sir, there is a question from Mandeep Shilpi. Sir, as we anticipate late mandibular growth, so how much advancement we have to plan at the time of appliance delivery? No, we should go for uh, edge to edge. You know, if it is a 10 millimeter object, we should think in terms of uh, edge to edge. It should take a construction bite edge to edge. Now, what happens when you do edge to edge bite, the lower jaw comes forward. Still, there is a little rebound of the lower incisors, which I told you. So you land up an over jet of around one or two millimeters in those cases. So uh, average around 10 millimeter over jet, we should take a construction bite to 10 millimeters. And then you will see that you will get very good results. So one question is there on uh, uh, YouTube from Claudia Pombo. What's the maximum age to still use the bite block? So the, the bite block should be used during the uh, growing period. So around, like in, in, in girls, till 13, 14 is fine. Uh, beyond 14 or 15, well, you get more of a tipping, less, less of a growth modification because you get more of a dental willer, more of this thing. So when the child is growing during the peak of the pubertal growth spurt, that is the, in, in girls, it is around two to three years. In boys, around three to four years. So anything between 10 to 14 years is fine. So one more question is there from Claudia, sir. That is late adolescence is still good to use the bite block. That's right. Correct. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, I think so. Uh, this, these are the questions. Uh, we are done with it. Uh, Dr. Preeti, are there any more? I don't think so. I just checked. There are. Sir, there is one question, sir. I think so. From uh, Again, from Mandeep Shilpi. Sir, how much advancement we have to plan at the time of appliance delivery? Uh, uh, that I think so. Uh, you answered already. Keeping in mind that the, uh, there will be a late mandibular growth. Yes, sir. There is one question from Dr. Sandeep Goel. Sir, does not uh, the 10 millimeter anterior construction bite gives a lot of anterior force on the lower incisor and leads to more flaring? No, not really. As I explained to you, 10 millimeter correction when we do it. And there's a slight, very slight interior flaring of the lower interiors. And once we remove and go out to the sport appliance, around three to four degrees, the lower incisors go back. So this is uh, invariably we have seen in thousands of cases. So we should keep a target of 10 millimeter. We can go one construction bite. Beyond that, you have to reactivate and make new bite blocks or whichever you like. If you have got a 20 millimeter over jet. I have treated patients with 20 millimeter over jet, but then then and make two twin blocks or we have to take construction by three times. But like, you have to reactivate the plants three times. Ma'am, we are done with the question on the session? Yes, yes sir. I think so. Uh, thank sir. you so much, sir, for excellent presentation. And you, okay. as you have already said, that the timing of treatment is very important during the functional appliance treatment. And, and when functional appliance given during the peak of mandibular growth, 
gives maximum effect. So not only does it improve the facial profile, it also improves the airway, also helps in sleep apnea. So it's a wonderful appliance that should be definitely you see, it is, is, the mo- is the most patient-friendly appliance known fun- out of all the functional appliances. I have I had use almost all. You can use the Frankel, the activators, the bionators, and I have found that Winblock is the is the most patient-friendly, doctor-friendly appliance. And then wonderful results. After three to four months, you can, I have got more than 20,000 cases with twin block and you see excellent results with that. Cases after cases. The only thing is we have to see the basic principles at the peak of the pubertal growth spurt. We have to horizontal growth patterns, retruded mandibles, we have lower facial height less. High angle cases also you can achieve, but then you have to take, you cannot trim those cases much because you have to prevent the open bites and other things. They are slower growers, vertical growers, but horizontal growers patterns, this is the best appliance. Yes, good luck, it's the best appliance, magical appliance I say, not only for the class two cases, uh, deep bite cases, as well as open bite cases, as well as class three cases, it's a wonderful appliance and I think it should be tried. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to request our Dean, uh, Dr. Gurudat Naik, sir, to kindly give the vote of thanks. Uh, before I give a word of thanks, I would like to uh, see the overwhelming response we got, sir, uh, for, for your presentation. I would like to request uh, Kapoor, sir, that if uh, it is convenient uh, uh, for sir as well as to Sublok, sir, we can continue with the session tomorrow at the same time because we'll have the crowd also uh, continuing with the topic uh, for uh, for tomorrow. Kapoor, sir. Dr. Sablok, Kapoor, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Tomorrow, Kapoor, sir. Uh, can, we, can we keep it on Thursday? Fine, sir. Uh, I think because, Thursday would be better. Uh, because I have patients tomorrow. So okay. yeah. Thursday, Thursday I'm free. would be better. Because, okay, uh, fine, sir. Because uh, uh, participants will have a continuity with the lecture. Uh, yes, and yes. we definitely be benefited. So, uh, yes, the audience has to be informed much before. Yes, sir. And, sir, so, we can have the fixed functional appliance as well on that day. Actually, I have worked with Lisa Alvarto and 3M Unitech for this uh, forces appliance for the last 20 years now. We have celebrated the 20 years of uh, uh, forces appliance, and we have worked together and written a number of manuals on that. Uh, this is today the best fixed functional appliance known all over the world. So actually, 378 slides. So I was wondering how can I cover? You know, it's not difficult. Then we just wrote a new book with Bill Clark on fixed twin blocks. We came up with a new design of the fixed twin blocks. That is another uh, 200 that we can cover some other time. Fixed twin blocks. Right. <laughs> okay, sir. Sir, it was, yes. What? Yes. Let us announce the timing. What time will fix up? Uh, 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 we'll sure. conduct on Thursday at the same time or whichever time it's convenient to sublock, sir, sir? Sure. 730 is, 7.30 is okay because, it's fine. You, because is fine. the audience leave early, reason being dinner time follows. So let no, us we can start, start. We can start early also. I have no problem. I am free on Thursday. 7.30 is okay? That's oh, fine. Sir. Fine, sir. Fine, absolutely fine. Okay, let, let us meet on say, Thursday at seven thirty then. Okay, so we can uh, can we can we just uh, check with your uh, right, uh, I, yeah. IT guy if you can help us for this solving sir. this problem of the sound. Uh, sir, uh, problem I'm... is at your end, my dear. <laughs> sir, please share your presentation uh, beforehand only. Sir, uh, it's uh, I would you... like to acknowledge, sir. Uh, the it's a commendable job you putting your hand uh, mobile in your hand and giving a lecture it's a, such a anticipation it's it really shows your dedication towards your uh, thing i mean uh, you know we are, we are students of dr kapoor what we are today is because of him oh so, that's whatever a, we have learned we, job, we, sir. we owe to him uh, actually the problem is i don't know but uh, shad laptop may kuch problem hai sir no, this if is you are a... using one device, it will work. If you are using two devices, it will not work. 
No, I am using only one device. Only ah. MacBook Pro. Only. Sir, what we can do is, sir, sir, no, I would I request you to share your Mac... presentation. Share your presentation so that it can be shared uh, by uh, Himanshu, sir. Uh, sure, Madal, we can do that. But uh, if we can just check one day before or one hour before. Or find out some solution. We can do it. We can do it, uh, sir. The the problem is that only we already did a practice session, and at practice session it was doing fabulously good job. But when start no, no. last you... last time the same <laughs> problem happened with the ISO, and but I gave a webinar for American Association of Orthodontists recently, okay. and then it was fine. It was working excellent. I don't know where is some problem. But Maybe, uh, just... I have experienced uh, the same problem with uh, one one of my own. Uh, I mean, uh, there is something in with Dubai thing. I don't know. No, no, no. Pata nahi sir. Ek aur hamne bhi kya tha. Udhar this is problem hota. I just this is I gave for European Orthodontic Society then a of around seven webinars. No problem. Okay. Okay. But uh, I don't know. There is some problem. <laughs> We have to check. We'll try to fix up, sir. We'll surely try If to. If we fix can up. check. And fix up. I will be grateful to you, oh. at least day before, because I requested uh, Dr. Preeti Bhardwaj. She said <clears throat> it beyond my means, so okay. I, so maybe that she's uh, she is not able to help. So if you can help, I will be grateful. We will surely try because this is a this is a very rich material, you know. I know people can benefit out of it, and people are asking for the, your presentation. In in fact, yes, I'm... sir, it was a great presentation, sir. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. On thank you for your listening yes sir thank you thank you sir on behalf of mansoor dental college i would like to thank the international college of dentists central zone section 6 for giving us the opportunity to organize this webinar in association with them i would also like to thank uh, our chief guest professor dr uh, jyotinder kumar sir our guest of honor professor dr krishna nayak sir uh, our eminent speaker professor dr ramesh sablok sir uh, professor dr rp gupta sir president icd section 6 uh, professor dr mahesh sharma sir chairman uh, cd icd section 6 uh, dr rajiv chuk sir uh, secretary general icd section 6 uh, professor dr dn kapoor sir regent central zone icd section 6 and the organizing chairman who has been the instrumental in conducting this program sir dr v s kohli sir deputy regent central zone icd section 6 i would also like to extend my wholehearted gratefulness to our honorable mrs manjula tiwari ma'am chancellor mansoor global university professor dr arun kumar pandey sir vice chancellor mansoor global university Mr Gaurav Tiwari sir co chancellor Mansoor Global University and CD Mansoor group of institution for standing in support and extending encouragement to every initiative taken by us my thanks also goes to our creative team headed by Mr Himanshu Pandey for all their technical support not but the least i would like to thank uh, the organizing secretary dr preeti bharadwaj who is the professor head in the department of orthodontics and dentofacial orthopedics uh, in mansoor dental college and her entire team and all the participants for making this webinar a great success thank you everyone and uh, we will meet again on thursday at 7:30 pm thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you so much